This, this is the Our Auto Expert Podcast. Find us on air, online, on mobile, and on your smart speaker. Please subscribe at ourautoexpert.com. Our Auto Expert. 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 Now, here's the host of Our Auto Expert. Our Auto Expert. Nick Miles. Locally created, nationally celebrated from the northwest to the southeast. This is America's Car Radio Show. If it has a throttle, we'll feature it on air, online, on mobile, or on your smart speaker. This is our auto expert. I'm your host, Nick Miles, along with, I called her weirdo before we got on the air, but truck girl, <laughs> truck girl Jen, she doesn't like the headphones that she got given this morning. We no. had to swap. Yes. I had to give her, she, she wants, she's so, oh. If you just had any idea, imagine car shopping with her. You'd probably throw yourself off the nearest back end of a truck. No, no, no. Wait a minute. <laughs> I don't think so. Why? Are you easy to car shop with? Yeah, I know exactly what I want when oh. I go. I mean, just right now, clearly you knew what you wanted. I had to give my headphones up for That's you. That's right. <laughs> I'm a girl who knows what she wants. These ones are grouty. Well, they're just, they were soft. Oh, dear. <laughs> see, see how hard it is to deal with it? And this is even before we get on the air. It's it's a tough show. Uh, coming up on today's show, lots of really cool stuff. We're going to dive into NASCAR, uh, something that I'm fascinated with, but I don't know a huge amount about. Uh, NASCAR is kind of an interesting, I, I want to say sport, but I guess it's not really a sport, right? Is it a sport? <clears throat> Oh, sorry. Interesting sport. Um, we're going to be talking to <laughs> Patrick uh, Demir. Uh, how do you say his last name? Demarco. Um, Demarco. Demarco. Mm -hmm. Okay, Probably, yeah. it's all right. Yeah. Uh, Patrick Demarco. He is a manager at NASCAR and an analytics at Ford Motor Company. We're going to really talk about the new 2020 NASCAR Xfinity Series Mustang, which has been unveiled. So, if you're a racing fan, that's definitely something you want to be part of. Uh, we're going to talk about the new Silverado. Uh, 2021 Silverado gets a complete new interior, as the GMC Sierra does. Uh, finally. They've been talking about it's going to get a new interior, completely gutted, completely new. Jen's like, her eyebrows went up. Does that mean I have to buy a new trunk? Mm -hmm. um, so <laughs> we're, going to, we're going to talk about the current... A third uh, Silverado for me. <laughs> we're going to talk about the current truck. Uh, we're also going to talk about uh, the, the new truck coming. Uh, in 2021, uh, completely gutted new interior. We'll have some details on that. Eric Newland joining us. Uh, he's at the Historic Races, 60th anniversary for Mini, and he's going to be uh, telling us all about that. I um, I have owned several Minis in my life. I currently have a Mini Clubman. No, I currently have a Mini Countryman, <laughs> John Kubworks. I sold the Clubman, sorry. A little confusion in I, counting my cars. And I have to tell you also, I got into trouble about that, but that's a whole different story. <laughs> uh, Eric's going to talk about the 60th anniversary of Mini, and then Brian and Armistad's going to be joining us. He's going to be talking about uh, something kind of cool. Uh, he has been driving the new Bust Mustang Bullet. Brian is is one of my best friends in the world. He's seven foot four, or I think something ridiculous. He's two feet taller than I am. And um, when, when we hug, it looks horribly inappropriate. He's a large African-American gentleman. And we hug often, and it looks kind of weird. There's well, pictures all over the internet. I was going to say, then, then I'm definitely not sure if I want to meet him. <laughs> He's really, because he, you're shorter than I am. I am. Brian's pretty awesome. And then, of course, Anton Wallman is, uh, Trump calls out GM in China, and also talking about the latest Tesla truck is just going to, just around the corner. They're just going to uh, reveal that coming up. We're going to find all about that. And, of course, uh, talk about some things. So last uh, week, last show, um, I got in a little bit of – it came out on the radio that I had a new motorcycle, which I rode today, by the way. Mm -hmm. And uh, because my uh, significant other doesn't listen to the show, I was safe talking about it. Well, apparently not. <laughs> 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 that went downhill fast. However, yeah. um, here's the funny thing that a third party told us told me that my significant other knew about the motorcycle and hadn't had a chat with me about it. I guess we're getting the chat. The chat. Uh, have a chat about it. And uh, so the chat hasn't happened, and, and my other half doesn't know that I know that they know that I know. But your other half is pretty understanding. No. <laughs> God, that's me. Try and live in my house for 10 minutes. You know, it's funny that I don't get in trouble for purchasing things. You know, when I buy stuff. I get in trouble for the amount of room that we have. So, gotcha. so it's I'm actually not in trouble for getting the bike. It's going to be where is it going to go? Because you have a garage. So and now you need so to I have buy 30, a lift. I, no, oh, that, and so that then be. you can no put because it's just more on. stuff. And but you and, can lift stuff. 
And it all started uh, when we started watching Hoarders. Oh, geez. And now it's like just a fear of becoming a hoarder. And so you're not a hoarder. N- well, w- we have early signs. <laughs> <laughs> There's early. Ho- I have I have 13 parking spaces in my driveway. Yeah, I noticed. Um, it was hard to park. There yeah, this it was morning. hard to park there this morning. <laughs> I have. Uh, I have uh, a new Tundra sitting in the driveway. I have a new Forerunner sitting in the driveway. I have my Animal Rescue rig sitting in the driveway. I have my Lexa sitting in the driveway. Um, and that they're big. And two uh, bikes in the garage. Uh, BMW. Oh, by the way, this is the cool thing. Two yeah. bikes in the garage and one in the shop. <laughs> uh, here's the cool thing. Uh, BMW called me last week and said, you know, you've been driving the M- uh, M850i for um, like a week. Yeah, could, the could one you, that you were messing around with me. And yeah, the, yeah, yeah, pretending mm-hmm. that the top came down, voice yeah, activated. Voice activation, yeah, no, yes. I wish it doesn't. Um, anyway, so they said, could you hang on to it for another f- week or so? Because we can't come and grab it. Oh, and I was darn. Like, okay. Uh, so um, I always know when my other half is home because the top is down and George Michael's blaring in the house <laughs> as, as the car pulls into the driveway. So... Uh, it's it's kind of a good al- well we have a camera system that signifies or right. signals us when everybody anyone comes in the driveway um, anyway so I rode my bike over today the new bike is sitting downstairs uh, the, here's the saddest part about it when I used to be uh, on another radio network uh, it was like a seven eight mile drive it's it's about a mile right now so I think the bike uh, it still smells a little when you when you ride it mm-hmm. it's 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 a Honda uh, Rebel. The 500cc with the ABS. I put saddlebags and a pillion passenger seat on the back because I have lots of fancy bikes and I wanted something I could like go shopping with that had saddlebags. I'm not a fan of saddlebags because I think they look dorky, but it doesn't look. Does it look bad? No, I think it looks good. It looks okay, and it's actually a bike that um, anybody that doesn't ride could drive. Ride could ride because it's easy. It's, it's low it's really, to the ground. It's too. low to the it's ground. Really it's not a big engine. I have a 1,200cc engine. This is over 500. The 1,200 can go 75 and third. I mean, I've never done that because that would be against the law. But hey. um, it, it goes 75 and third, and it's a lot of fun. This uh, this is really fun. It's easy to maneuver. It's easy to ride. You drove in behind me today. How mm-hmm. was that? You look so cute. Uh, uh, <laughs> no, uh, <clears throat> I just have to say cute wasn't actually something I was okay, going for. Uh, I was see. going for like manly or uh, rough and tumble or sexy. Okay, or... well, how about this? Your shoes match the shirt. Look really cool. And it matches the bike. Such a girl. Yeah. Such a girl. <laughs> All right. Stand by. We're going to talk NASCAR coming up on Our Auto Expert. <laughs> You're listening to Our Auto Expert. All right, so um, I'm, I've been driving Fords. Uh, recently, I, I drove the Explorer ST. I explored the Explorer Hybrid about oh, a lot of miles, uh, oh, around 500 miles. I mean, I mean, I had to fill. I had I drove from Chicago in the new Ford Explorer Hybrid to Milwaukee, Wisconsin, not Oregon, and then from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, I drove to Indianapolis, and I did it. That's about that's a lot of miles, but I'm not really good at hyper miling. Uh, in these cars, I tend to, it's supposed to do 500 miles in a tank. They just announced this week the new Ford Explorer hybrid would do about 28 miles a gallon. The best I could get was 27 out of it, mm-hmm. but um, there's something wrong with my right foot. <laughs> it's like super heavy. No. And um, <laughs> I really have a hard time getting uh, the right <clears throat> fuel economy. I don't know why. You're probably the same, though. I am. I'm completely the same. What is that? Is What's the car with the leaves? Is it the f- Leaf, the Nissan Leaf? No, not the Nissan Leaf. It's yeah. the Ford. The, anyways, where you put your foot on the gas. C-Max. Something. And the leaves fall off as, in the yeah. hybrid. Is, you, you kill the trees. I did kill the trees. <laughs> it's stupid. I pay attention more to those leaves. I'm like, come on, grow back. Well, that's the whole yeah. idea. It's all like a mental game of you trying to reserve electricity and yeah. those sort of things. I, I get the whole electric car thing, and it can be super fun. Don't get me wrong. But it's also... Um, it's kind of about, <laughs> I want a V8 with makes lots of noise right, and going exactly. It's a horrible thing to say, but I really do enjoy big engines and loud noise cars and, and that sort of thing. Oh. Like, I'm revving cars to see. So I this whole week, I spent a week doing driving up and down, uh, doing morning shows um, for TV. Mm-hmm. So I anchor quite regularly on TV stations around uh, the country. And I was doing that this week. 
and taking cars in to do car segments uh, with the anchors. And so I'm driving around an awful lot, and and I really got to experience these cars and, and drive them from place to place. The hard thing is, though, I sit in them oftentimes, and I rev them up to see if we can do that on the air, and they make lots of noise. And I always say, no, let's not do it. It doesn't make enough noise. The only cars that make good noise like Ferraris and Lamborghinis and stuff. But they're just like, should we rev it up so everyone can hear it? And I'm like, uh, no, it just doesn't make enough noise. I like it so it makes the windows shake in the TV station. And then the anchors are trying to read the next headlines like in the studio after I'm done doing my segment. And they're like, we couldn't read them because you were making so much noise revving the engines <laughs> in the parking lot. I got in trouble because at Fox 5 in San Diego, which is technically one of my home stations, uh, in our, obviously Fox 12 in Oregon, but Fox 12 and, and Q13 in Seattle and, and, uh, Chicago, and Fox 5 in Vegas and WGN. Anyway, so, so I got in trouble because Fox 5 and Fox 40 in Sacramento had both had the um, blacktop redone in the parking lot, oh, and no. I peeled <laughs> I peeled out and <laughs> And the engineers who are the ones that redo the oh they were furious. We just paid sixty thousand dollars to redo our parking lot. Did you sign it? Uh, Nick was here. No, <laughs> I, get silver. I should carry a silver sharpie and like sign. The- You've given me a brilliant idea. Forget those stars. Wait, just I do, just like, so uh, sharpie just make uh, it's weird that I know this, but they make a new oil based sharpie for yeah. shoes. Oh, for so shoes. you can um, the whites on the bottom of your shoes. You can color them in and mm-hmm. get them white again because sometimes you know how the they don't get white. So they made this oil based sharpie that you can do that with. That would be oil based and it would sink it into the blacktop in a parking lot. I could autograph the parking. That's right. Lot. Nick was here. You are. Like I said, I'm going to be graffitiing parking lots of TV stations <laughs> all over the United States. Watch out, Fox. <laughs> you, oh, you just give me a brilliant idea. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so I've been driving these cool Fords um, around the country. Uh, the ST is always cool. The new Ford. It's $50,000 for an SUV, but it does sound great. And you put it into sport mode, you can suck the tank dry. <laughs> I experienced that. <laughs> of sucking tanks dry, even in the hybrid, oh, I was horribly. My gas mileage was horrible, but the new Ford Explorer is a lot of fun. Um, so you have the ST version, so you can. I had the ST in San Diego, and, and then, then the hybrid and, and version. hybrid versions in like Sacramento, and then all over the Midwest. So how did the two compare? I mean, besides, the, power. they're different. They look different on the inside. The things operate different. The trunk operates different. The, the hardest thing for me is because I plug my phone in and I use uh, Android Auto mm-hmm. all the time. It plugs in in a different place. So it took me – when I got into the ST, I was like, where Where'd it go? Yeah. <laughs> where do you plug it in? I don't know where it goes. Like, and it's the middle of the night. I just like flew in. It's like 8 p.m. Not middle of the night. Well, it's the middle of the night for me because I do morning TV. But it's the middle of the night. It's like 8, 9 p.m. I just landed in San Diego. It's in the dark. I'm in some parking structure picking the car up, and I can't find where to plug my USB in. It was a little challenging. Okay. The wor- but I, I, I offset it. I went to In and Out Burger, so I, f- I felt better. Oh, after that. lots better. <laughs> <laughs> I did. So you know, it's really interesting too because we we drive a lot of cars, yep. and the worst thing for me is I think I was in a Mercedes and I couldn't figure out how to turn it on. <laughs> <laughs> and the funny thing is, is I asked a couple other people, and they didn't know either. We had to call the rep over. Do you ever run into that situation? <laughs> um. No, but they do move some of the start buttons around. Like uh, most of the start buttons, so it's interesting. Audi have been ch- experimenting things with the volume buttons, the start buttons, moving them around. I mean, the obvious place for it was on the steering column. Then mm-hmm. they moved it actually onto the dash by the steering column, and then some people moved it into the center console, and then some people moved it to the right hand side of the center console, and some people had it on the left hand side. Uh, Volvo is one of the cars that people often have a hard time in working out where the start button is. Um, they have, they're a really nice XC90, the new one, which mm-hmm. we're going to be driving next week. Can't wait. Um, that has like a toggle. You have to push it to the right, push it like a glass toggle. You have to push it to the right, or push it to the left to start it or stop it. That that confuses a lot of people. Um, okay. a, lot of, a lot of exotic cars confuse people. Range oh. Rovers confuse people because it's on the left-hand side of the steering wheel because that's how it is in England because the steering wheel is on the other side. Right. Um, we're going to be driving a lot of these cars. I know. I'm really excited. We're, we're doing an event called Run to the Sun where uh, the Northwest Automotive Press Association get to choose the most fun-to-drive vehicle, the best convertible, and we're driving a slingshot too. I know. I can't wait. It's basically a glorified <laughs> motorcycle with two seats side-by-side and three wheels. Mm-hmm. Would you think that's bad? I said that. 
What? Glorified motorcycle? No. Okay. It kind of is. It's made by Polaris, who it's also more, okay, make you motorcycles. Okay, say more like a luxury Well, there's kits, there's kits out there, so I, I kind of want one. Of course that, you do. I want everything, don't I? Uh, yes. I'm so material. Um, <laughs> I kind of want one, but they have uh, a kit where you can take, because it has a one wheel at the back mm-hmm. and two wheels at the front, and they have a kit where you can convert it to two wheels at the back. Okay, I'm all over that. Yeah, so look it up. Look up Slingshot online. You should post a picture of this on, on uh, our auto expert Facebook. Look up Slingshot online and then the four-wheel conversion kit. Um, it's kind of cool. Uh, we were trying to talk about Mustang because you know, we're Where so you? ADD. Yeah, we were trying to talk about Mustang. <laughs> There's an all-new 2020 uh, NASCAR X- Xfinity series of Mustang just been unveiled. Uh, and, and the cool thing about this is uh, NASCAR seemed to be uh, Mustang and Toyota – Toyota and Ford seem to be doing really, really well um, in their car development. Uh, it's always been Chevy. For years and years and years, Chevy's kind of owned Mustang, uh, owned uh, NASCAR. Uh, but they're doing a really good job. Uh, the, the latest Mustang race car was developed as a joint between Ford and the Ford Performance Tech Center, uh, where they developed the tools and simulators uh, really to advance this to make a, a really cool a piece of machinery. Uh, the, X- the NASCAR uh, Xfinity Series Mustang will make its race debut during uh, Speed Weeks at the Daytona International Speedway uh, on, f- on Saturday, February the 15th. That is my, one of my so, favorite tracks. Is it? Daytona? Oh, yeah. Never raced that. Done a lot of exotic racetracks like uh, Bahrain F1 track and uh, Portugal, Autodromo in Portugal. That was a bunch of fun. Never actually uh, done a lot of U.S. tracks. Uh, Willow Springs, uh, PIR in Portland. Uh, yeah, I did Portland. With the Ridge, Motorsports Park, yeah. Seattle. Uh, the Vegas NASCAR, done that. Never done a Chicago. Never done San Diego. I don't think they have a racetrack in San Diego, do they? I'm just trying to think. The, um, no, just look at, Willow just, Springs Laguna is kind Seca. of LA's. Laguna Seca is really Northern California. Yeah. I done the uh, the Willow Springs, which is about two hours out of LA. Done that one as well. That's kind of cool. Um, Virginia Raceway raced that um, quite a few actually. Well, Nolans raced the racetrack in Nolans. That was kind of fun. Uh, what are you making fun of me? That's how you're supposed to say it, isn't it? Nolans. New Orleans. Nolans. Okay. Anyways, I think you need to upgrade to uh, to Daytona. All right. Let's see if we can do that. On my plan. All Stand right. by. Coming up, we we'll talk more cars, and we we'll talk about the new 2020 Chevy Plus, new interior coming 2021. You're listening to the R Auto Expert podcast. Packed show today, talking about some uh, very cool cars that we've been driving, and uh, motorcycles too. We need to get more motorcycle guys in and to talk about bikes. Uh, we should get the guys on the phone from Indian because I, I have a Triumph and I really want an Indian. I want an Indian so badly. I feel like super materialistic now because all we've been talking about on this show is all of the cool vehicles that I have uh, been owning. And uh, we're, not, we're not really the vehicles that you should be shopping for. Uh, I do have some interesting updates. So it's the first week that Megan's, uh, they're at the beach today, but Megan's son, uh, Noah, had his motor, uh, his motorcycle, his car, which he bought a Ford Mustang. And uh, she seems to like it more than him. I feel somehow that he won. He got the car that he always wanted. We, we had him test drive a bunch, and there were, all, there were always things that weren't that cool about it. Uh, which is a little bit depressing, uh, but he got the car he wanted. I always am just a bit nervous about putting a 19-year-old into something like a Mustang. Even though it was a V6, it was a good choice. I think they paid about 13000 uh, for it, and they got a good vehicle. Uh, now Megan kind of wants a Mustang, but she has other kids. I think, I think getting rid of a minivan would be great for her, but I just think it's... Uh, why doesn't the whole family have uh, Mustangs? Uh, Jen's whole family had Camaros. So that worked out for you. I don't know why we have Mustangs. Uh, we were talking a little bit about uh, the new 2020 NASCAR uh, Mustang, and um, that's the Xfinity Series vehicle uh, that's uh, newly unveiled. Newly unveiled, by the way, by the uh, the guys at Ford and the Performance Center. Patrick uh, DeMarco is on the phone. Uh, good morning, Pat. So, Patrick, so tell us a little bit about uh, you just unveiled this new race car for NASCAR. Uh, this is this has been you guys are constantly developing vehicles, but uh, Ford really seems to be making a huge impression into NASCAR and working hard to make vehicles that are, are really high performance. Yeah, we're you know we made the decision uh, a few years ago to start bringing the Mustang across our global racing series. 
um, including the Virginia Supercars in Australia, the IMSA GT4, uh, the Cup Series in NASCAR, the NHRA Mustang for Bob Tasca, and then now the Xfinity Mustang uh, rolling out here for NASCAR. There's probably uh, it's probably yeah it's probably no coincidence that the Mustang is like uh, one of the best selling sports cars in the world if not the best selling sports car in the world. I know that when it was introduced into Germany, uh, people went crazy for it. And there's now it's interesting to be in Europe and see Mustangs drive by, which you never got to see years ago. Uh, so it's it's a global car, but the race series is seem to be what's leading part of that charge. How hard is it to develop a car that needs to be on the track, and how different is it from the one I might buy for my four? dealer yeah the you know it is a global car um and, and just a side note that i was in germany working for ford performance at the time when the mustang came out and everybody over there was you know the guy everybody started buying them it's kind of cool to see um but uh you know it's it's different than what the the race car is on uh the race car compared to the road car but you know it the the dna um of the mustang uh the daylight running lights the tail lights the you know, the grill, the pony, those are the things that are uh, important to us. Uh, and in NASCAR that we make sure that that brand identity comes out. And every time we do a new car in NASCAR, we look for more and more ways to do um, to do better, uh, to make sure that it, it represents the car that's on the road. So, do, you, do you learn um, a lot from developing the race car? Does it sort of, is it trickle down economics into the road car that we buy? The, I would say the, the actual body itself and the parts in that do not but the people the processes the engineering tools that we use are the same tools that are used in our production cars so the next generation mustang that's being developed for the road is using tools that we've developed in our uh in for performance on the motorsport side we make them better we the people that we have internally um come and go and they get back into production and you know the speed at which we develop things the pace at which we do things is all you know moves into production and that's how we help the production car programs it's kind of exciting of yeah if, if we go to SEMA this year will we see this this new car or will it make it to SEMA uh, I'm not sure if it'll be at SEMA I, I'm thinking maybe um, <laughs> I wouldn't see why there'd be no reason why we shouldn't have it at SEMA but I not my I mean Sure, to making the cars go faster, and the uh, marketing side will do what they need to do to make sure that it's out there for the fans and uh, the public to see. I'm right. pretty excited to, to see the new Mustang come out. Yeah, me, me too. Um, um, we uh, are fans, and we're going to be talking about the bullet later in the show with Brian Armstead. Well, Pat, thanks so much for uh, getting on the phone with us and talking about the new NASCAR Xfinity Series Ford Mustang. I'm looking forward to seeing the, the first race when this gets rolled out, and we, we hope that you get continuous wins on this vehicle. Uh, we will get the chance to talk about a current Mustang that you can buy, which is the new Mustang Bullet, named after the film 50 years ago. Brian Armistead, an auto journalist from the East Coast, has been driving that, and he's going to fill us in on that as we continue. You're listening to Our Auto Expert. Welcome back to the show. Of course, we uh, I've been driving a lot of big trucks recently. Uh, we recently went to Bend, Oregon to drive the new Chevy Silverado HD, the heavy-duty version of that, um, and it has some amazing abilities mm -hmm. and then the news broke yesterday or a couple of days ago that they're going to completely do the re the interiors on the silverado um so that's kind of exciting news for 2021 but the 2020 chevy silverado is an amazing piece of machinery and sells uh you know you can hardly keep them on lots and a lot of people buying trucks around the country, so we thought we'd get our pal on, Shad Balch from Chevrolet, to talk a little bit about the new Silverado joining us now. Uh, this, the new Silverado got revamped, right, Shad, about a year, a year and a half ago or so. I, we had it unveiled in the Detroit Auto Show, uh, and now it's on lots and the HD version just coming into dealerships right now. So it's a pretty big deal for Chevrolet, right? This is, this is the, the pinnacle of uh, what you sell, mostly trucks and SUVs. SUVs? Oh, yeah. This is our bread and butter. Full-size pickup trucks, full-size SUVs, these are what we do really well. And, and frankly, we can't fill them fast enough. I love... Jen doesn't like it, but I love the fact that it has uh, some grade levels of the new one have Chevrolet written across the front. I like the Chevrolet part. It just... 
it looks it's the heavy duty looks it's interesting it's big let me tell you it's big I, but it it's not big. hard i told i'm not a good t- I like I, chad i know you're a truck guy through and through because you did truck racing that's how you started your career but do you are you good at towing oh yeah and that's the best part about this the the latest uh generation of of silverados is the towing technology is more advanced and there's more options and features available than there ever has been I was just looking through, I have a Silverado right now, and there are 15 different camera angles, camera shots that you can now add to your Silverado to help with towing ease and convenience. Everything from a side view, behind you, inside your trailer even. All of these different technologies are available to make it very easy and seamless to tow as much as you want. I, I will tell you, even stupid people like me can tow now. I'm I'm so not a good tower. Like, I'm so scared of towing anything. And I went and I drove the HD, and I could tow huge amounts. Is it 35,000 pounds? Is that what it does? More than 35,000, yeah. yeah more 35, than five. Yeah, I mean, that. what is that? That's like a house? I don't know. That's a lot of weight. You know, but, I'm good at towing. I just suck at backing up. Well, that's the, <laughs> All right. So, like a boat, you there, know, that kind of thing. But that's the problem with towing, right? I, I mean, you've got to be careful when you right. tow. You can't do some of the things that you do without a load on the back. But I love the fact that, that, that Chevrolet have a camera in the back of the truck because – the the trailer is valuable, but what's inside it is where I the know. money is. Your horses or whatever you're towing, your race car in the back. That was a, a pretty much a stroke of genius, and that's getting a lot of attention, isn't it, Shad? It sure is. I mean, it's it's the first in its segment for a lot of these technologies, and and just like you said, you know, the backing up and and trying to hitch up to your trailer. It often required, I mean, forever. It required two people to do it. You had somebody standing between you and the rig and backing you up and guiding you. With the camera systems now, all of that is eliminated, and one person can literally back the truck up, hitch up to the trailer without having any sort of you know repeat or faults. It's very intuitive to do, but also there's there's technology like monitoring your tire pressure on the trailer, okay. um, making sure that your your tail lights and your blinkers are always working. All of those things you just sort of had to wing it, mm-hmm. and now with the, with the way the technology is, is fixed up now, it's all there. When you I, buy the truck. I like the fact that on the launch uh, that your colleagues uh, had some socioeconomic data about how uh, how many significant family arguments caused during towing. That was it was pretty. Uh, <laughs> it made me smile a lot because I can just imagine uh, husbands and wives, couples shouting at each other uh, and getting really annoyed at each other. You're been nodding, there. like Jen. Have you been there? Oh, yeah. yeah. You've yeah, had, you've had fights with well, significant others. I'm short, you know, so it's easy to not be able to see me in the mirrors and run me over, kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, was it ac- accidental? <laughs> yeah. Are you sure it was accidental? <laughs> <laughs> we'll just keep going. <laughs> the, uh, the, these things, a lot of this stuff comes as standard equipment as well uh, on on the trucks. Uh, it's not like uh, I mean, it doesn't come on the base grades, but a lot of the the grades, this star, stuff starts to come as standard equipment. Uh, is the heavy-duty vehicles, are they mostly used for towing, Shad? They are, yeah. I mean, when you buy an HD pickup truck, you have a specific pers- uh, purpose in mind, whether it be to tow or haul. If you have, you know, maybe you have a horse trailer or a camper trailer or something like that. When you go to uh, buy one of these big pickup trucks, you know exactly what you need it for. And that's why there's so many of these customizable options available. So we don't force you to buy things you might not need. But we do make everything available so that whatever you're towing, whatever you're hauling, you can get the best experience when the, with the HD pickups. I, I like the idea that you don't have to buy stuff because so many people have stuff in their vehicles that they don't use or they don't want. And it just happened to come with that. Uh, that was the only way they could get it. I like the idea of being able to tailor it down. Uh, my dad in his SUV, he has a bunch of equipment he doesn't use. He uses like the Bluetooth and he uses the sport button. That's about it. You know, so when he's getting on the freeway, he likes to show off that he can go faster than everybody. <laughs> but most of the other cool stuff that the car comes with, he doesn't even know is there, which is kind of interesting to me. The, uh, the one of the things that I've also noticed about these vehicles is that, uh, there's been a lot of thought put into stuff that people don't usually think about. So a lot of times using the tires to climb into the bed, uh, you guys did stuff in the back. So it was easy to get into the bed from the side. And for Jen and I, I mean, I'm only five foot four and Jen, how tall are you, Jen? 
Yeah, almost five foot. <laughs> <laughs> Jen's five foot. You made it so we could actually get into the bed of the vehicle with steps specially made. Yeah, so this is going to sound very cliche, but it's very true. We do listen to the customers when we build and design these next trucks. The truck segment is so competitive that, Nick, just like you were saying, these little things, these little creature comforts are what can make or break a deal in, in figuring out what truck to buy. So things like the rear step bumper to be able to hop up easily into the bed of the truck. We, we also put one on the side. So the side rail, I think on the high country, it, it mechanically moves back so that you can use the side rail to get into the front side of the pickup bed. Um, file holders inside for the work trucks or where uh, foremen can, can keep their paperwork. Cigarette lighters, AC adapters, you name it. We know exactly where the customers want to have these conveniences so that we can get them to pick our truck. I like uh, one of the things that got pointed out to me at the release of the truck uh, when it was uh, shown off for the 1500 when we went to drive that. And that is that you thought about also longevity of a vehicle and replacing stuff in a vehicle. So a lot of times where, you know, people use these trucks, I think the average ownership is somewhere around 11, 12 years of these vehicles. Uh, if it's Jen, it's 20 years. Yeah, I was going to say, I have <laughs> and, and, and so things, things... I've got an old one. Right, things need... You have two Chevy trucks, I do. Right? I have yeah. two Silverados. So things need replacing on them. They get broken. They get backed into... And one of the things that got pointed out is that in the competition, which is is the, the, uh, the Ford F-150 and the Ram 1500, they have the sensors actually embedded in the light. And Chevrolet didn't want to do that because they, that tripled the price right. of a light replacement. So they put the sensors actually in the footwell at the back. And that idea made it so if you backed into something with a tail light and you broke it, you weren't going into, a, a, you know, into your local dealer going... <gasps> Whoa, that's and so the, the the truck's not just about buying it new, Shad. It's about ownership for a whole twelve years, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, the truck customers—they're customers for life, and we know that. So it's important that we make the the total experience of their ownership not something that they regret, because those little things are what will you know help us lose a customer if if they can't fix it easily or if they can't maintain it easily. Those are the things. I noticed uh, news in my news feed uh, starting to crop up uh, yesterday and over the last couple of days. Uh, the fact that you guys announced that there will be new interiors in 2021. I mean, I don't find anything wrong with the current interiors. I thought they were pretty nice. I like the rubberized dials on the inside. I think that's great, especially if you've got dirty, muddy hands. Mm -hmm. You've been easy hauling cement. Yeah, easy to clean. It's not, you know, it's not getting scratched. It's like, not like painted plastic, the sort of rubberized interiors. But you guys are... Um, uh, there, there's been plenty of stories in the press, and maybe it's uh, not official, uh, but you're, you're revamping the interiors for 2021. Yeah, I mean, uh, we're always updating the trucks. Uh, this is the, it's an all-new generation, so everything from front to back bumper is completely new for 2019 and forward. But, yes, we are always making improvements and updating every aspect of the truck, whether it be the powertrain, interior, exterior. Uh, you'll always see improved changes. Uh, one of the things I like, too, is uh, I, I'm really into the black. I, so I have an SUV, and I went and sprayed the wheels black. Not personally, but I had them done because I think black wheels are really cool. Um, my other half didn't like that very much because they were, they were all into the chrome. But black towel is kind of a hot thing right now, and you're also doing trim levels, and uh, I know some people call it spidering out. Uh, you're also doing these trucks that are sort of midnight editions, the the – the sort of aggressive off-road uh, versions of the truck. So even you're not using it for work and you're just using it for a stylish vehicle, you're actually doing that in the factory. Oh, yeah. I mean, we love our special editions, if nothing else. Uh, there's a flavor of every truck that you can possibly imagine at a dealership. And the best part about this is when it's done by us, it doesn't, you're not infringing on any warranty uh, certifications or anything like that. So... We have many configurations. Uh, I, I love the blacked out. There's the midnight edition. There's the dusk edition. Um, all sorts of different configurations you can build your truck. And when we do it for you, you're getting it right from the factory that way. When are you going to put a Camaro uh, like or, or a high-powered engine in this thing so I can get 1,000 horsepower out of my Silverado? 
Oh, they're coming. They're coming. <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, then I'd have to buy number three for sure. <laughs> uh, did that, that's what everybody wants is like a thousand horse voucher. I'm not sure. I mean, I probably for do it. what? What would... What? To, sh- to be the coolest person in your neighborhood oh. and show off to all your friends. Do we, do burnouts in the driveway so your and you want it in a hate. truck, not a Camaro or... No, a I want it in a truck. Or Corvette. It's uh, all about the bragging rights. Uh, yeah. Like, yeah Come on now, Jen. <sighs> it's, you've got to show off to all your neighbors. You've got to have a better car. Than, all my neighbors have uh, GM and GMC, Chevy and, and GMC products. And to me, to shop with a thousand horsepower, any time I have a Silverado or a, a, I mean, the Traverse, one of my favorite vehicles, too, uh, it, parked in my driveway, uh, everybody shows up to have a look at it in the neighborhood. They all, everybody has. Uh, when I pull the Camaro out, it's the same way right? in my neighborhood. Everybody loves it. Mm-hmm. Uh, Shad, the new Silverado HD, uh, is it in dealerships now that tows uh, 35,500 pounds? It is. And also. Nick, when you were up in Bend, you drove, but we didn't have fuel economy numbers for the new three-liter inline six turbo diesel. Oh yes, tell me, tell me. Yeah, and since then the EPA has certified the numbers, and it's the best in class. So nice. it's a twenty-three miles per gallon city, thirty-three miles per gallon on the highway. Nice. Three. That's Wait, so you bridge the thirty miles a gallon because the previous competition could do the best they could do is twenty-nine. Yeah, we're at thirty-three, nice. and this is wow. a full-size pickup truck. That's All right, insane. Shad. I love talking to you, and I could talk for hours and hours and hours. Uh, the RRS, the Blazer RS, by the way, uh, my favorite vehicle right now. I just love that vehicle. I love it. We I get, haven't driven it yet. Oh, well, you I'm just going to next talk to week. Shad. Shad will fix it for you. All right. Uh, we look forward to driving the uh, the some of your new cars at uh, Run to the Sun as well, which is coming up. So Shad Balch from uh, Chevrolet, thank you for joining us. Anytime you're welcome on the show. We love talking about your product. Uh, still to come on this morning's show, a ton, or the, today's show, I should guess, a ton of really cool stuff. We're going to get to talk about the 60th anniversary of Mini. Yeah, that's right. And and the fact that the historic races are coming up. Plus, the new bullet from Ford. We'll talk about that. You're listening to the R Auto Expert Podcast. You guys know very well that I'm a huge Mini fan. And, uh, well, I'm a huge British car fan. But there's somebody in the world that out British car fans me. He has no right, but he does. That's <laughs> Eric Newland. Uh, Eric, how are you? Thanks for joining us on the radio Great. today. So, Excellent. Thanks, Nick. Thank tell, me you, Nick. Wh- tell me what you're doing today. Uh, 60th anniversary of Mini, and uh, you guys are doing some cool stuff, right? Yes, absolutely. We're having uh, Patty Hopker, who won the 1964 Monte Carlo Rally, as our guest for a, the largest all-British field meet in America, right here at Portland International Raceway. It's been going on for 43 years. You've not been actually in attendance for 43 years. You've got to go home at some point, right? <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. I will eventually make it home. But no, it's been going on for 43, right? Right. So, <laughs> so tell us a little bit about Patty because he's, he's, a, he's somewhat of a, an icon in the, in the mini. Uh, I know you've gone to England to see him several times. He was one of the people that really put mini on the map as far as, and as the Monte Carlo rally did, as far as a car company because of his success with the brand. And it really made a huge difference because mini were never seen as a super challenger. They were always uh, Mercedes and Ferraris and mm-hmm. cars in that race that were expected to be right. so amazing. And, and you man, you know, mini managed to put themselves on the map. Thanks to Pat. Yes, absolutely. Outside of Alex Isagonis, who created the Mini, and John Cooper, who made it, you know, a, a racing legend, you know, Patty Hopkirk was one of the three, you know, musketeers, might you say, who really made it a you know, success for, for England and the British Motor Company at that time. And, and Patty sort of continued to promote the brand. He never really jumped ship. Um, you know, he's done a lot in his career, but Mini was his main focus and has been since he won those uh, races in the 60s. Yes, absolutely. He's uh, very passionate about making sure that uh, England is still a success in the motoring world. So, yeah, he's still a, a, a mini um, agent, might you say, who goes out and represents mini brand and getting people interested in, you know, the the new minis as well as the old minis alike. The, uh, the, the old minis, you actually have uh, at least one in your collection. You, you still have your old minis, the, the, super, uh, the, the super original, like, 70s minis? Yes, actually, uh, the car I have is a, a 59. It was uh, one of the first minis that was imported to uh, Oregon at the time, sold through British Motor 
distribution here right off of uh, right in Portland, Oregon at the time when it was Sandy Boulevard. <laughs> way, way long time ago. <laughs> that it, to me, that's it's, it's incredible. And it's also, I know we did Mini Takes Estates with you last year. Uh, you drove that car in Mini Takes Estates. And it's incredible to see the old Minis, the fact that this is one of the style of cars that won that amazing race. And it's so yeah. small. I mean, Eric, you're not a big guy, and you are cramped in that vehicle. <laughs> oh, it, it, it is comfortable. But I can tell you one thing on that Mini Takes Estates. I was really wishing I had a brand new Mini with air conditioning <laughs> and uh, the luxuries of uh, you know 2018 at the time. So, oh well. Did you? It's uh, still fun. That and that car, that your car is uh, is pretty original, right? I mean, it, there's there's some modifications to it, but it's you haven't like updated it with Bluetooth and all those things, have you? Yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely. And, and that Mini that we had, we're in, yeah, that was a little more of a later model Mini. And, you know, they made them. Uh, all the way up from 1959 to the year 2000. Um, and uh, unfortunately, the United States stopped importing them back in 1968 and 69. So, yeah, it is interesting what's available here in the States now when it comes to classic. They are, you know, it's kind of like camping, might you say, a little more rustic, uh, <laughs> but they're, uh, they're definitely fun. I'm telling you, I'm not sure I, I'm not a big fan of camping. Because there's no cable, there's no there's no cable TV. I do enjoy, uh, yes. I do enjoy my current mini. And and has Patty raced some of the newer minis? Uh, has he been in behind the wheel of say the uh, the 2019s, 20s, the John Cooper works? Yeah, those are definitely really amazing cars. And uh, this year they have their 60th anniversary model that uh, I've seen in British Racing Green, and it really goes back to the you know the originals in a way i'd say the way that they're bringing them back so, tell, very cool tell us a little bit about the british field meet so this is uh it, it this is where a bunch of uh anglophiles get together in a field with their vehicles absolutely yeah there's uh typically between uh seven to 850 um, all british cars parked out here from triumph lotus uh rolls royce bentley uh morgan you name it uh, it's here. People come from all around the West Coast for this car show. And uh, it started off in Blue Lake Park again 43 years ago. And then in 1984, it moved to PIR. And we had Labor Day weekend for um, all those years up until last year when we were bumped one week because of uh, the IndyCar races. So, but we're really happy to see the Indies here. And that's actually where I'm at today. So enjoying the races here again. Um, the, the, the so the All British Field Meet uh, has featured vehicles every year. Uh, I think la was it last year was Land Rover, and this year, or who was it last year, and who is it this year? Last year we saluted uh, Jaguar. Okay, I think it's pronounced yeah. Jaguar. Oh God, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> and so, who's the salute to this year? Well, uh, for sixty years, we're uh, of many. We're we're saluting many, and that's why we've brought in Patty Hopkirk as our guest. And uh, we've also included, since on that FPIR that weekend, as well as a car show, there's also vintage racing put on by Sovereign Racing Group. And we coordinated with them to bring an all-mini race uh, on uh, through the weekend. So you're going to see 25 minis on the track this weekend, all trying to take the, uh, the Shelton chicane at one time. It should be really entertaining. <laughs> How many wide do they go? Uh, well, I, I would say maybe 25, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that must be a, so you should, you should, Eric, I know you're a film guy. You should set up a camera there. There should be some shenanigans yeah. in the chicane. Uh, uh -huh. that, that, Absolutely. That sounds like a, a lot of fun. Are you, uh, are you driving in these events too? Um, I am, uh, helping with the, uh, function of the event and I am not. A uh, vintage racer at this time, but I would really like to be. I've gone to a couple other all mini races at Mid Ohio and down in the Bay Area, and it is one of the coolest things I've ever seen. Uh, you know, see these little tiny cars just, you know, very competitive, r racing all out. So, yeah, I mean, it really has opened my eyes up to take maybe a stock mini and get it race prepared. So, and look this is a good opportunity to see, um, walk through the pits, you know, talk to the racers and talk about their you know, their cars that they put together. And some are really, really amazing uh, quality builds. You, you, you would never think you'd want to be racing at full bore, but they do. Eric, in the last 20 seconds, tell us where we can find out more. 
All right, you want to go to abfm-cdx.com. You can also go to Facebook and search for all British Field Me Portland. It's a couple time right Eric Newland, celebrating 60 as a mini. We'll be right back. You're listening to Our Auto Expert. Welcome back to the show. Uh, if you've been listening, we've been talking an awful lot about Ford and the uh, new NASCAR. Uh, if you want to listen to previous shows, you can do that by going to OurAutoExpert.com. There you can see videos of all of our TV appearances, previous shows, and, of course, read articles about the latest vehicles. They're all online. You'll be able to hear today's show there as well. Replay it as many times as you want. And, of course, you can activate it, activate it on Spotify by uh, using your Alexa app or your Alexa itself. Have you done that yet, Jen? No, you haven't done it at all. You need to, you need to activate Spotify and no, listen to the show. I, listen, I to listen to our auto. Hey Alexa, listen to our auto expert on Spotify. See all these Alexas when everybody has yeah, you know, just went off. Yeah, did they? See what I do? <laughs> uh, we. I talked about this guy a little bit at the beginning of the show. Uh, he is one of my favorite pals in the automotive industry, and we are like chalk and cheese. I'm a short, fat, white guy. Uh, he is a very, very tall, deep-voiced, masculine, African-American gentleman. Uh, Brian Armistead is an auto journalist from the East Coast. Uh, Brian, the pictures of you and I tend to go viral when we take them together. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely, Nick. Uh, great to be on with you today. So you've been driving the new Mustang Bullet, and this is a car that harkens back to the movie from around 50 years ago, the Steve McQueen movie called Bullet. This vehicle has a lot of attributes from the original movie. I know that it, uh, 20%, 25 to 50% of the budget of the movie went just into the chase. And that was a two-week film, and the rest of the movie just took them four weeks to film. They illegally closed down the bridge in San Francisco, the Golden Gate, to do the filming there. They had people dressed up as police officers uh, who weren't real police officers to stop traffic. There was a lot of shenanigans around the movie, and the car really harkens back to that amazing piece of machinery. You've been in it for a week, Brian. What are your first impressions? Well, I got to tell you, Nick and Jen, there's a lot of shenanigans involved around this current 2019, 2020 Mustang Bullet. You know, I've driven a lot of different cars. We all have over the years. I've driven Bugattis and, and Ferraris and Rolls Royces and Bentleys. I have never seen as much neck snapping as I have <laughs> in the last couple of days. I mean, I'm at a, I was at a stoplight on Pratt Street in Baltimore by near the Inner Harbor. And people literally stopped in the crosswalk that were crossing uh, perpendicular to me. And they, they, they stopped in the middle of the crosswalk and looked at the car. And they, they, the traffic agent was like, you guys got to get moving. You know, there's a, there's a ball game tonight. We got to get out of the way. <laughs> so, you know, Mustang has always been that iconic brand. 1964 and a half, Lee Iacocca has a dream. The 65 Mustang is born, and the rest is history. Now, what's different about the Mustang is that it's the only pony car that survived the whole, you know, 1980s, 1970s, 1980s uh, madness from the American auto industry where they just didn't quite know where they were going. Camaro was lost. Firebird was lost. Uh, Camaro, of course, was uh, re reinstituted in a, in a much more uh, uh, compatible form. But um, the Challenger, all of the supercars, all the muscle cars from the heyday were lost. The Mustang is the true pony car for the ages and it's a beautiful car it's great styling i'm six foot nine as you mentioned earlier and i fit very comfortably behind the wheel of this car and the thing i like about the bullet as opposed to the gt350 which is also you know mustang for the ages is that it's actually drivable day to day the gt350 that motor is so raw it just will kind of rattle you to death or be the drone you to death after a period of time but this Mustang Bullet is silky smooth, just like Steve McQueen. It's a lot of fun to drive. It's got unique bullet features. There's a bullet logo on the steering wheel, door sill plates, unique bullet uh, turned aluminum trim, bullet MP002 on the dash, bullet uh, faux gas cap on the rear. It actually looks like a 1960s, 1970s-style gas cap, but it's actually uh, just a mock-up. A bullet strut brace under the hood. Special can air uh, style air filter for better breathing, and this baby rocks. I mean, the performance is phenomenal. It's um, 
got all kinds of different parameters for track mode and street racing mode. It, it literally, Nick and Jen, is a race car for the street. I love the fact that, too, Brian, and this is, you know, the visceral response from driving this vehicle is Ford worked really hard on making this a uh, vehicle you could hear from a block or five away. Oh, absolutely. But it's not as loud as a GT350. That's the point I was trying to make. Yeah. So when you're doing steady-state cruising in fixed gear on the highway, it's just a nice hum. Right. It's not that raw, you know, Shelby, you know, I own the streets roar. And there's nothing wrong with that if that's what you want. But I mean, I'm an older guy. I don't, I don't want to, I don't want that Shelby roar. So this bullet three, uh, this bullet is just right down my alley. You know, they also have the EcoBoost fastback, which has 310 horsepower from a 2.3 liter four. And Nick, if you remember, they came out with a 2.3 liter four in the 1984, 1985 Ford SVO. So I mean, this whole EcoBoost technology, everybody is doing, has gone back to turbochargers based on Ford's lead with uh, EcoBoosting uh, Mustangs and even F-150s have uh, this small displacement turbo technology that just that's just kind of rewritten how manufacturers are eking more power out in a cafe, a corporate average fuel economy uh, era where they need to get maximum fuel economy, but consumers demand maximum power. Right. And I think that's one of the things that they got absolutely right in this vehicle as well. I know one of my friends got number 63 off of the production line, uh, Matt Maranowski, who lives in Pittsburgh, a friend of mine. Uh, they also uh, came out with some ex- you know, extended colors in this. Initially, it was just that bullet green, yeah. and they came out with right. a black, I think a blue now as well, right? So, so you're not just, um, if you want it in different colors, you get that opportunity as well. Yeah, but you know, for me, for me, Nick and and Jen, I mean, if you're gonna go bullet, you gotta go bullet green. Right. <laughs> you know, you, you, you gotta do it. You know, my neighbor, who's an older guy, he's he's in his sixties, and you know, he kind of marvels at all the cars that end up in the driveway. He no, he never comes over to say anything about the cars, even when they're like, you know, like I had a Phantom in the driveway. He just waved and said, "Nice car." He came when I pulled up in this bullet. He came over and said, "Well, what kind of car is it?" I don't, it looks like a Mustang, but there's no pony on the grill. They have actually taken the pony off the grill in the bullet, so it can have that unique kind of signature that you want when you're spending, you know, fifty grand, forty-seven to fifty-five grand, depending on options, you know, for for a performance vehicle. It's really special. I've had a lot of fun driving it. Um, you know, this is one of those cars after a seven-day loan where you just say, no, no, I'm sorry, you can't have it now. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I feel like that quite... It's the cheaper. Right, I feel like that quite regularly. And, I, and even listening to the stories about the fact that Steve McQueen was so adamant that he got to choose the uh, snooker ball uh, shifter. Uh, he went through, they, they showed him like 16 different ones. He had finally chose one. And it was important to Ford to put that back and, and bring the identical one back in the vehicle the throwback to heritage the excitement i think that's yeah. part of this car i mean it's great performance they, they don't make a horrible mustang uh the, and it's great performance the the fact is that they've also been very pure in returning this car to the streets with homage to the original i'm going to open the door for just a second so you can hear something real special i'm on the car's bluetooth right Ooh. now The power of radio sound. (laughs) It's all about uh, imagery in the mind. Yeah, it's uh, an incredible piece of machinery. By the way, uh, Brian, I just did a little math while we were on the air here, and uh, you're one foot five inches taller than me. So okay, okay. That's and you you fit. You know, go ahead, Nick. I was to say you fit in the car foot fine, right? Yeah, I'm. You know, the manufacturers can't make a nickel building cars for people my size. You know, I weigh 300 pounds, and I'm, I'm almost seven feet tall. But surprisingly, I've got enough leg room to manipulate the clutch. And you talked about the snooker ball cue. Um, this thing, one thing I like about it is it doesn't get hot. Like yeah. the old Lexus um, IS, um, when the first IS came out, it had a metal ship ball. You get third-degree burns when you went to change gears. Right. Um, yeah, I, I fit I fit just fine. Um, I'm, you know, I have headroom. If it had a sunroof, I would even be able to... Uh, Manager sunroof. Excellent. Of course, with the uh, sharp curvature of the roof, a sunroof is not an option at this point. 
But you don't want a sunroof in a car like this. I mean, if you want to, if you want the top down, go get a Mercedes SL or a, right. you know, or right. a, a Lexus convertible or something. But Brian, we, for, we're out of time. Performance. You're listening to the R Auto Expert podcast. Well, thanks for being part of our radio show. Catch up with previous episodes of the show at our website, ourautoexpert.com. You can hear all the past shows, see our automotive videos, and read inside car stories about our next ride, your next ride, and you'll find it all at ourautoexpert.com. Plus, on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, start a conversation with us at Our Auto Expert. We don't, uh, we don't make life difficult. By the way, if you're thinking of buying a new car, we always reach out and offer this to you. We're happy to have the discussion with you about your choices. And uh, one of the things we can do is help you find the right car for you, find the right vehicle for you, and also uh, work out exactly what you should be putting in your driveway. And sometimes we can help you with the pricing, too. Uh, we have a lot of friends in the business who will be more than happy to have your business, and they will, uh, they will often extend uh, what's going on as far as discounts to you, uh, show you where the best deals are. I've got some secrets up my sleeve as well. So uh, just reach out to us on social media. I'd be more than happy to help you. Frankfurt Auto Show is on the way. Some new debuts from German manufacturers. Joining us on the phone, our independent investor and analyst, Anton Wallman. Uh, Anton, are we all revved up for Frankfurt? We are revved up in the electrical sense, which means approximately 14000 per minute or something like that because an electric motor spins really fast uh basically there are two major headlines coming up for the frankfurt auto show this year one of them will actually spill a few days before the show even starts and that is the porsche take on which debuts this upcoming wednesday in both uh, germany as well as a simultaneous unveiling in north america so that's the $90,000-ish plus automobile that will compete at the highest of the high end of any four-door electrical car scale. And then at the lower end of the scale, a few days later, we will see the Volkswagen ID3, which is going to be a mass market vehicle initially intended for the European market, uh, where deliveries are set to begin uh, uh, roughly around uh, April or May next year. So let's talk. I mean, I have to, unfortunately, the sad thing in my life right now is um, I'm putting on an event in the Northwest called uh, Run to the Sun with the Automotive Press Association here, and I can't be at that unveiling. It's going to be done in Toronto of the Taycan. Uh, we know an awful lot about the vehicle. We've seen a lot of uh, concepts. We've seen a lot of information come out about it. How much more are we going to learn at the unveiling? Well, uh, we should learn all the final specs because there are two things, really, actually I should say three things that are really remains to be, um, to be found out that are of great importance. First of all, the range. And the range will in turn be dependent on the version of the vehicle and how big of a battery it will have. So will the base version have, say, 250 miles of range? Will the high-end uh, version of the Taycan have at least somewhere 250 to 275, 280 miles of range? That is one important detail uh, left to be told here. The second one is obviously the price. Where along the pricing scale uh, is this vehicle going to fall? Is the base price going to start below $90,000? Will it start above $90,000? Included portions will be eligible for the federal tax credit, which is about uh, uh, $7,500 per vehicle uh, for the U.S. market right now. So clearly it will be eligible for that. So let's say that the thing is $92,000. Basically, it will come in just below eighty-five dollars net of the federal tax credit. So I think those are the two major important details left to be, uh, to be found out. In the last 30 seconds, uh, Anton, before we take a break, do you think that this is going to compete with uh, Tesla's Model S, or do you think it's going to be more expensive? Uh, it will be slightly more expensive, but that does not mean that they won't compete, because you're talking about a very thin market here with very few choices. So on the one hand, it doesn't compete for everybody who would buy a Model S, but it surely will compete for a lot of people, or at least some people, that are buying a Model S or would have bought a Model S. 
All right, Anton Wallman, he's our independent investor and analyst. When we come back in the next portion of the show, I want to talk about a few things that are on the table as well. We also will be looking at uh, China and the sales tax for the all-new energy vehicles. Uh, We're going to talk about after three months that Chevrolet has delayed the GM's uh, final deliveries of the six-cylinder diesel. They're starting to roll into uh, dealerships as well as the GMC version of that vehicle. And California, uh, they have a new admissions uh, regulation coming up, but is that going to raise the price of cars? That's a big question. Plus, the fact that Chevrolet, their Bolt, uh, they've managed to outstep uh, the Model 3 in the range. And so is that going to put them ahead? Should you be buying a Bolt versus a Model 3? Anton's going to answer all those questions as we return in our Auto Experts part of the show. You're listening to Our Auto Expert. Catch up with previous episodes of the show on our website, ourautoexpert.com. You can hear all past shows, see our automotive video, and uh, also read inside car stories about your next ride. Anton Warman is our guest. He's an independent analyst and investor. He's joining us on the phone. Anton, uh, we covered a lot of ground. We have a lot more ground to cover this morning. Let's talk a little bit about the ID, which is VW's new electric car unveiled, hopefully, in the next few days. That's right. So this is going to be uh, Volkswagen's first volume electric car that they intend to make in a factory where they will be able to produce 330,000 units per year of cars on this platform. Now, of course, there are going to be five or six different vehicles on this platform made in that factory. So I think they've said that they're planning on making about 150,000 per year of this specific version, which will at least initially be only sold in Europe. Over time, it'll also be sold in Asia, but this particular body style is not planned for sale in the United States ever. The problem is for electric vehicles in the United States that a lot of time they don't come to the United States because we're not as in a friendly electric market as Europe are. And that's something to do with mandates uh, in a lot of the European countries and rebates. So are we going to have to wait a long time to see these VW electric cars come to our shores? No, uh, one year later, so uh, basically at the end of 2020, uh, you will see the version that will arrive in the U.S. at that time, at the very end of 2020, maybe very early 2021. It's essentially going to be a crossover slash SUV version of uh, this type of vehicle. So think about it as a Volkswagen Tiguan, but electric, although it won't really look like uh, Tiguan, it, it will, they'll strive for a more futuristic look to it. And of course, the interior is said to be a little bit more spacious, but that's the general type of vehicle uh, in terms of the version of this all electric car with over 250 miles of range that we will be seeing, seeing here in the U.S. either at the very end of 2020 or early 2021. So let's switch gears a little bit and talk about China sales taxes on energy vehicles. It was hard to get a license plate in China for a gas vehicle if you didn't already own one. But uh, what I think they have decided is that they have uh, the possibility of a vehicle, um, you know, vehicles over there now reducing the sales tax for them. That's right. So uh, previously, uh, some EVs were indeed exempt from sales tax in China. Sales tax, I think there's about 10% on new cars. What they did now is that they also exempted imported all-electric cars. So basically, if you are sending to a Jaguar I-Pace from Austria to China or a Tesla from California to China, uh, if as a buyer in China, uh, you don't have to pay that 10% sales tax on any of those vehicles. One more thing, and that is that they've also approved an additional 12 new hydrogen hydrogen fuel cell cars from this exemption. So there's an undercurrent underway in China right now with several senior government officials visiting Japan and looking very carefully at whether hydrogen fuel cell cars may end up being the future for China. So this is the silent undercurrent that we will be watching very carefully in the uh, several quarters and years to come. 
Let's talk about uh, General Motors. Now, after three months uh, delay, GM have finally delivered the straight six-cylinder diesel of the Silverado and the Sierra 1500. Why did it take so long? Even though we have great fuel economy numbers, oh, we heard earlier today that 33 miles a gallon is uh, what they're rating it, which is at four miles a gallon better fuel economy than the best that Ram could do with their 1500. Uh, is is this significant uh, that they had a three-month delay? Well, uh, basically, the EPA in the U.S., the Environmental Protection Agency, which certifies the emissions and the fuel economy numbers, simply took an, an awful lot of time to test this vehicle to ensure that there was no way that there were any uh, funny business going on with the way that uh, GM uh, achieved these numbers. So basically, it took them just about almost a year to do this, but that wait is finally over, and uh, about two or three weeks ago, these vehicles started rolling off the assembly line and are now arriving in dealerships pretty much as we speak. Uh, is is this going to be a boost for them? Because one of the things is the Silverado, great vehicle, but there were sort of a lot of complaints. They slipped to number three in the sales numbers for a while below Ram, the 1500. And this is partially because it took so long for them to try and catch up with the sort of models that people were looking for. Uh, things like the diesel, things like the uh, I mean, Ram had the hybrid engine and the big screen. Uh, GM now sort of playing a catch up. Is, are they going to be able to catch up to Ram? now that this diesel is hitting this, the dealer lots? Well, this is certainly one factor in their ability to start catching up here. Uh, the main reason why GM has uh, lost a little bit of market share here, particularly to Ram, is because the interior of their full-size trucks simply isn't as plush and beautiful as are the really superior interiors in the Ram 1500, uh, where GM has a little bit of an advantage is that GM right now is the only automaker which offers a straight cylinder option both for diesel and gasoline in any full-size um, full size uh, half-ton truck. So they offer a straight four-cylinder in the Silverado 1500 and the GMC counterpart, and then they offer a straight six-cylinder diesel engine also in the Silverado 1500 and uh, GMC Sierra. So if you're interested in a straight cylinder option and the benefits that offers, GM right now is the only option in the full-size half-ton U.S. pickup truck uh, segment. Now, now, for those people that don't know, why would a straight cylinder be different from a from a v, V6? Well, a straight cylinder basically means that, uh, first of all, the, uh, so the, the engine is self-balanced. You don't need these balance shafts. So that saves a little bit of weight and complexity and potentially future long-term maintenance expense. It also, therefore, saves uh, a bit of weight. So... You're basically getting to a package that may weigh a little bit less and have uh, fewer parts and may last a little bit longer. You may have seen that recently Mercedes has gone back also to using straight six-cylinder engines in the, some of their vehicles mostly sold outside of the United States. And we're also hearing that uh, FCA, Fiat Chrysler, is going to be using this new approach in many of its uh, new vehicles that are starting to come out at the end of 2020, such as the Jeep Grand Cherokee, for example. They're going back to a straight six-cylinder architecture there as well. So this is something that used to be more prevalent in decades past uh, when cars were indeed rear-wheel drive in many cases, but the V6s were uh, introduced in the 80s and so forth in order to fit better for front-wheel drive cars. And uh, basically the straight, uh, the straight cylinder options are starting to come back, and GM is the first to put them in the full-size uh, half-ton uh, pickup trucks at this point. Is there a real future for diesel in in the United States? I mean, it's it's something that's crippled Jaguar Land Rover. It's something that's been really hard after Dieselgate and the VW scandal. Uh, a lot of people now not as accepting, but truck diesel trucks seem to prevail. Well, it, it really only has a future in very expensive vehicles as well as in pickup trucks because the incremental cost that it takes in order to make diesels emissions compliant are so high now that in a regular car, uh, it, it really is impossible to justify for most people the extra expense that it costs to uh, to buy one of these and to pay them off with driving uh, these vehicles very long uh, stretches over time. I mean, many tens of thousands of miles per year for many years in a row is really what it's going to take in most cases. Or you can uh, essentially pay back this benefit by... Uh, enjoying the superior towing uh, 
uh, comfort that it brings. And that's where the pickup trucks come into play. So basically pickup trucks that are more expensive and that are used to tow, this is the area in which diesel uh, vehicles shine in the U.S. market. Let's uh, keep our eye on emissions and talk a little bit about California. And, uh, the, you know, California have a new emissions regulation coming up. The chances are, though, that this could be expensive for people. That's right. So California, plus at least 10 other states, have joined together to determine that we are going to have some very extreme standards for fuel economy going forward. The problem with doing that is that in order to achieve such fuel economy numbers, you have to spend many thousands of dollars more per car in order to achieve them. So calculations uh, that are out there today suggest that the average price of a new vehicle would have to rise by at least approximately three thousand dollars in order for these vehicles to pass these new emissions laws so if you like your new toyota corolla your new uh honda civic uh, and so forth the cost three thousand dollars more going forward you should definitely be in favor of this the problem is the incremental benefit from an emission standpoint is now so tiny that we're paying a lot of money to achieve only a tiny tiny improvement in, in emissions and the problem that this means is that the people who are unable to buy these cars because they're so expensive are not going to be replacing the oldest vehicles in the fleet. Think about this. The cars that pollute the most that are out there today are the oldest ones. Those uh, stinkers that we see on the road that are 20, 30, even 40 years old, those are the ones that need to disappear from the road and be replaced by the the most inexpensive new vehicles that can be built on the market. But if you make those inexpensive vehicles, instead of costing, say, $14,000 after uh, dealer discounts, if they now have to cost seventeen or even $18,000 after de- dealer discount, that means that fewer people can afford to buy them. And what's the result? Uh, the result is that the cleanup of the air simply does not take place. So the effect here is completely counterproductive. Let's talk a little bit about what's around the corner for uh, General. Mo- uh, sorry, for Tesla. Uh, they they're unveiling their new pickup soon. Uh, is this going to be a pickup light? Is this going to be meeting all of the things that Elon tells us it will meet, or is this just more gas in the air? Well, first of all, I think that whatever, as a concept, what they're putting out is going to look absolutely wonderful. Whatever they've come up with is going to be an extremely futuristic design that is going to cause everybody's jaws to drop to the floor. I think the specs will be incredible, zero to 60 in under three seconds, uh, and all sorts of specs in terms of range and, and, and capabilities on paper that are going to, uh, you know, be extremely uh, impressive. Uh, Of course, uh, the problem here is that Tesla has no factory as of yet in which to build such a vehicle. And as a result, uh, building this vehicle and delivering it into the market is many, many years away, at a minimum two and a half years. So whatever they're going to show here in the next couple of months, supposedly in October or November, uh, is going to take a long time to get to market. And during that time, you're going to see other startups such as Rivian um, and uh, what's that other company that make the off-road uh, Bollinger and uh, for that matter, Ford and General Motors and Toyota. They will all be coming out from, with various classes of electrified uh, pickup truck. So by the time the Tesla makes itself to market, maybe in 2022 or 2023, uh, there will be lots of competition for electrified pickup trucks. Um, just one little note here. I, I got a, an, a sort of a very interesting invite from Lexus to join them in Tokyo um, to talk about their some kind of new electric uh, announcement. And I'm going to guess from the information I already have that that's going to be the in-wheel motor that Alexis are about to announce at the Tokyo Motor Show. Do you have any insight into that? The only thing we know about uh, Toyota and uh, Lexus is that they made a commitment uh, at some point in the last two years to uh, bring out a very large number of pure electric cars, meaning not hybrids, not plug-in hybrids, but pure battery electric vehicles, we will start to see them unveiled starting at various points over the next year. So maybe, just maybe, this is one of the bricks right. in that wall of, of, of attack on the pure electric market from Toyota slash Lexus. Right. Anton, tell us where we can read your stuff. Uh, I can be reached at seekingalpha.com as well as on 
thestreet.com. Anton Warman, uh, everybody in this entire radio complex brains together doesn't equal anywhere close to his. He has the inside on uh, everything. Probably the most uh, intelligent guy I know. Thanks for joining us and talking to us about the future of cars and what's going on in electricity and at Frankfurt. Uh, with previous episodes of the show, you can listen to them all at ourautoexpert.com, plus see our videos and read some articles. You've been listening to Our Auto Expert with Nick Mile. Find all the show episodes at ourautoexpert.com. Please follow us on all social media, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Our Auto Expert. And message us for a quick and witty response.